People can sit here, do you know? I'm trying to block it up so we don't we don't hear everybody in the microphone. Not here, but they can sit on the edge. Yeah.
Martin E. Siegel Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Today, you will see a stage reading and adaptation of the novel Snow by Nobel Prize winner, Orhan Pamuk, who is with us in the audience. Blondine Sabatier and I have adapted the novel Snow for theater. The play was directed by Blondine in the National Theater of Strasbourg in 2017. It has since then toured in France and in China. Taylor Games has translated our adaptation into English. We will be presenting this evening some selected scenes of our adaptation of Snow in English. It is going to last approximately one hour and 30 minutes. Now is the time to turn off your cell phones. Please take out your cell phones and check that the ringer is turned and silent. Thank you very much. About the novel, the poet Kerim Anakushon, who prefers to be called K, his initials, comes back to Turkey after a long exile in Germany. In Istanbul, he is hired by a newspaper, Cumhuriyet, to write an article on local elections and mysterious suicides of young women. The events take place in Kars, a city in the extreme east of Turkey. The poet, Kerim Alakoshoun, who prefers to be called Ka, travels by bus to Kars. Traveling with him in the bus is a theater company with the once famous actor and director, Sunay Zayi. When the poet Ka arrives in the city called Kars, the snowstorm falls in the city and isolates it from the rest of the world for three days. Extraordinary events will happen during these three days. Carl's presence in the city is an event in this remote border city. Everybody wants to meet him and convey their vision of the city's problems. But the events triggered by Sunay Zayi, the theater director, will turn upside down everybody's life in cars. The silence of snow. This is what you think of sitting in the bus. If this feeling in you were a poem, that is what you would call it, the silence of snow. The exceptional beauty of it makes you even happier than seeing Istanbul after all these years. You are a poet, and in one of the poems of your youth, you wrote that only once in a lifetime does it snow in your dreams. Lovely city, and they're good people. But it's better not to go out alone. That's 
very kind of you this sat down there. The suicides have been greatly exaggerated. Of course, it's a quiet city. You spoke to the wrong people, and they gave you the wrong information. How do you know where I went? Uh, the police followed the obvious. And we, out of professional necessity, listened to the police. 90% of the information in our newspaper originates from the car's police force. And the intelligence agents know you're asking everyone why cars is so backward and poor, and why so many girls uh, killing themselves. I'm doing my job, Sam Valle. I'm going to tell you the true story of cars. Before, we were all brothers. But these past few years, people have started to say, I am uh, Azerbaijani, I am uh, Kurdish, oh, I am Turkana man. Of course, we have all kinds of people here. We always have Turkoman, Armenian, Lazi, from Poso, Germans, deported from Russia by the Tsar. Uh, but no one was proud of their identity. Now, because of all the foreign power that wanted to divide and weaken we're more proud and more poor. What about the Islamists, Father Bey? Ah, Islamists are going door to door, bringing women burger, soap, pots and pans. They play on emotions to create relationships in the poor neighborhoods. The men discuss with the men, the women with women. And uh, they say, this poverty afflicting us is because we have turned from the path of God. By the end, these poor guys don't have faith in anything except God's party and its candidate. God's party is the prosperity party. And uh, its candidate is Luke Darbe, the ex-husband of Eve Pekhani, uh, Turgut Bey's daughter. Uh, Turgut Bey uh, runs the hotel you're staying at. Luke Dar is not the sharpest tool in the shed, but he is a Kurd. And Air Kurds make up to 40% of the population. The prosperity party is going to win the local elections. Everything is being remote controlled by the international Islamist movement, which wants Turkey to be another Iran. Even the girl suicide. Th th those girls are being used, and we're gathering the denunciations to prove it. But we'd rather not write anything about it for fear of encouraging even more girls to kill themselves. But we've heard that Blue, <coughs> the famous Islamist terrorist, is here to incite him to suicide. But are the Islamists against suicide? Sedar Bey, what news have you prepared for us today? Allow me to introduce Qasim Bey, Chief of Intelligence. We have the honor of having Kat with us, our great poet who lives in Germany. Yeah, he's come to cover the elections in Paris for Juliet, and to investigate the suicides of our girls. I don't read the leftist press. Well, welcome to Cars, sir. The city's a peaceful city. Would you like protection? <laughs> protection? Well, a plain clothes officer. That way you'll have nothing to worry about. Do I really need one? Our city is safe. Chasing away the terrorists and the separatists? You never know. If cars is safe, then I don't need one. It's up to you, sir. Up to you. I'll leave you with Serdar Bey. We'll take good care of you. Serdar Bey offers Ka, as one offers a carefully wrapped gift, the first page of the freshly printed newspaper. Famous poet Ka in cars, known throughout Turkey. The poet Ka arrived yesterday in our border city. This is for tomorrow? <laughs> Our young poet, laureate of the Becet Nitzat Tihil Prize, which won him esteem of the entire country, will be covering the local elections for Chumhuriyet. Triumphant evening for Sunai Zayim Theatre Company at the National Theatre. The performance yesterday evening at the National Theatre by Sunai Zayim Theatre Company, known throughout Turkey for their instructive pro apatur plays, was enthusiastically received. The citizens of Kars, who have long hoped for such an artistic event, arrived in large numbers at the National Theater, which was fit to 
birds, even though they could have watched the performance from the comfort of their own homes. So indeed, the, the magnificent performance was also televised, thanks to the channel KTV, in their first live broadcast. Alongside plays dedicated to Ataturk, parodies of the commercials, which are eating away our culture, and a production of the most celebrated work of our enlightenment, My Fatherland, or My Scarf, there was a reading of snow. Latest poem by a celebrated poet, Kata, who is currently visiting our city. But I don't have a poem called Snow. And I'm not going to the theater tonight. Your newspaper will have printed false information. Don't be so sure. <laughs> Many people scorn us, saying we predict the future rather than report the facts. <laughs> But you should see their faces because every time What we report is exactly what happens. In fact, numerous events have taken place only because we wrote about them first. <laughs> That's modern journalism. <laughs> and, and this is why I, I, I'm sure that, that you will write a poem entitled Snow, and so not to offend us and deprive Carlos of the chance to be modern, you will come to the theater and read it. Scene three, New Life Tea House. He picks mysterious beauty. My years at university. First woman I loved. The suffering of being in love. He picks blue eyes. Her smile. Terrified of falling in love. charged but never arrested and we were proud of it. After the coup they started arresting everybody. <coughs> Students, journalists, judges. It wasn't a game anymore. I got out before they could arrest us. And how was it in Germany? <coughs> What saved me was not learning German. <laughs> my body resisted German. I would write poetry in the evening in my studio near the Frankfurt train station. Thank you. 
speak to anyone. I didn't speak to Germans or the Turks. They thought I was elitist and pretentious. I didn't see anyone. I didn't talk to anyone. Then I stopped writing. I guess that says you're going to read your latest poem tonight. I don't have a latest poem to read. Silence buried me in Germany. I haven't written in four years. But, well, what about you? Came here from Hoop Tower, took over his father's business, and it went bankrupt. My sister and father came after. Cardi Bay didn't pass the finals at university in Istanbul. She could get into the teacher's college here. The man sitting behind me was the director. Please, can I ask you a question? Please, 
Go ahead. Does being secular mean being atheist? No. In that case, why are our girls excluded from school in the name of secularism when they're only obeying their religion? Frankly, my son, this debate leads nowhere. We discuss these questions day in and day out on every television channel, and what? Girls are not more ready to take off their headscarves than schools are to let them in. Pardon me, sir, but is denying our girls, our hardworking, obedient girls, of their right to education in agreement with our Constitution, with freedom of education and religion? Isn't that at odds with your conscience, e sir? These girls were so obedient, they would take off their headscarves. My son, what is your name? What do you do for a living? I work at the Sender Tea House in Tokat, sir, just next to the famous Purban Hammam. It doesn't matter what my name is. All day, I listen to the standard. Sometimes I become obsessed with the injustice done to believers. As a free man who lives in a democratic country, I will find the person who obsesses me and ask him to his face to answer for this injustice. This is why I'm, I'm asking you for an answer to my question, Professor. Whose commandment is, grand, is greater, the state's or God's? We will get nowhere with this discussion, my son. What for Tyler is saying? Are you going to report me to the police? Don't be afraid of me, Professor. I hate terrorism. I believe in the love of God and in combat to ideas. That's why, even if I do have a nervous temperament, I, I never hit someone over a debate. I only want you to respond to my question, Professor. Wearing the veil is clearly called for. In the Surahs, the Confederates, and the Light, in the Holy Quran, the Word of God, your conscience isn't troubled by the suffering you inflict on these girls? My son, the Holy Quran, also orders us to cut off the hands of a thief. And yet the state doesn't cut off people's hands. Why don't you fight that? Very good answer, Professor. But uh, there is a world of difference between a thief's arm and a woman's honor, isn't there? According to the Af African-American professor Marvin King, a Muslim, in countries where women wear the prescribed dress, Rape and harassment are practically non-existent. Professor, in leaving these veiled girls uneducated and in glorifying unkempt women, what are we trying to accomplish? To sell off the, the honor of women like in Europe? My son, I have finished my cake. Excuse me, I'm not go. Stay in your seat. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down! And I won't have to use this. You see what it is? A gun. Yes, the Professor, no, I have. I hope you won't get angry with me, and, but with how far I've come to see you, I wondered if maybe you wouldn't want to listen to me, so I took precautions. <laughs> My son, what is your name? Vahid Susmir. Salim Sesmehan. Does it matter? Professor, I'm a nameless defender of the nameless heroes who fight for their faith and who are victims of injustice in this secular and materialistic country. I'm, I'm a, member, a member of no organization. I respect human rights. I'm against violence. I'm putting my gun back in my jacket. And all I ask is that you answer my question. All right. Sir, you have clipped the wings of these dedicated girls whose education has taken years. When a handful of them refuse to take off their head scars, you call the police. No, I, I'm not the one who called the police. Professor, don't lie because you're afraid of the gun in my jacket. When the police <laughs> dragged those girls through the dirt and took them to the station, did you sleep with a clear conscience that night? Transforming, transforming the veil into a symbol and turning this question into a political game has made our girls' lives even worse. What game, sir? A girl ki killed herself. Is that a game? Son, you're getting angry. Ask yourself, if the veil becoming such a politicized issue is the work of outside forces trying to divide us and weaken Turkey, 
if you let these girls go to school, Professor, this will be a problem. Is it really up to me, son? All is, all this is on Amkhana's orders. My own wife covers her head. Don't give me that, Professor. Answer the question. Do you have a tear conscience? I know so, Father. I didn't ask you if you were a father. Listen, I know how to control myself, but if I get angry, all this is my might get ugly. <laughs> in prison, I reformed everybody in my section. They were all praying by the end of it. Install your elders and point a gun at them. Don't you dare say the name of the Holy Quran again. And if you call for help, I kill you. Do you understand? I understand. So answer the question! What good does it do the country if women uncover themselves? Give me one good reason and I won't kill. <laughs> My dear child, I I also have a daughter. She doesn't wear a scarf, a headscarf. Her mother chose of her own accord to cover her head. My daughter chooses not to. I, I don't get involved. Why doesn't your daughter wear the veil? Does she, 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 she's some kind of artist? Is that it? No. And my daughter told me, Father, if there were a classroom full of girls wearing headscarves, I wouldn't dare enter without my head covered. I, I put on a hat scarf even if I didn't want to. Well, so? What's the problem if she covers her head even if she doesn't want to? Oh, God! You, you, you asked me to give you a reason, bastard. You have believers beaten for the comfort of your daughter. Many Turkish women feel the same way. 90% of women in Turkey cover themselves. And you only think about your daughter. You're proud that she walks around uncovered, you dick. Yes, sir, don't point the gun at me, please. You're getting carried away, and if it goes off, you might regret it. Why would I regret it? The assassin of the oppressor who persecutes the believer is a saint. But I feel sorry for you, so I'll give you one last chance. Give me one reason these decent girls should uncover themselves. If you can, I swear I won't kill you. If a woman takes off her headscarf, she has a safer, more respectable position in society. Maybe for your daughter who wants to play the artist. But strict religious dress actually allows a woman to protect herself from the carnal desires of men in the street. As Martin King says, if Elizabeth, El Elizabeth Taylor, the, the, the movie star, had worn a shot shot in the last 40 years of her life, she wouldn't have been ashamed of her weight gain and ended up in a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Professor, are you, are you laughing? Did I say something funny? <coughs> no. Say it, man. Why did you laugh, you atheist bastard? My dear boy, I, I didn't laugh. I, 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 if I did, it was unintentional. No, your laugh was sincere. I'm, I'm, I'm full of empathy for the young people of this country, like you, who are suffering. Don't flatter me. I, I'm not suffering at all. You're, you're the one who will suffer for laughing at these girls' suicides. You have no remorse. Let me tell you your fate. The justice of Islamic fires has already condemned you to death. The decision was a unanimous vote five days ago in Tokat, and I was sent to execute you. If you hadn't laughed, if you had expressed regret, I might have pardoned you. Here, take this paper and read your condemnation. Read it out loud or kill you. I. The atheist professor Nuri Yilmaz, my child, I'm not an atheist. I'll kill you if you stop reading. Read. Read. Come on. As an instrument of the secret plan to deliver the Muslims of Turkey to the West, I have oppressed believers who did not want to uncover their heads to the point that one of them committed suicide. My Child, please, I object to this. this. This girl hanged herself because of a love affair. She, she had given away her virginity outside of marriage. Shut up, you pig. That's the type of thing your poor daughter does. My 
Son, no. If you kill me, you'll compromise your whole future. Open your mouth. I'm going to shove my gun down your throat and make you pull the trigger. Then you'll see what suicide is. But in Germany, I was nothing. I was decomposing over there. Well, then why did you go there? If I was rich, I would feel ashamed of myself. And I would believe in God even more. One day, inshallah, we will all be rich. My thoughts aren't quite so simplistic. I want to be rich. I want to be a writer. I'm writing a science fiction novel. Uh, maybe one day it'll be published in the Lance. That's a newspaper here in Kars. But what I'd really like is for it to be published in the Istanbul papers. It sells thousands of copies. I can give you a summary if you like. Uh, could you tell me that it would be published in Istanbul? It's very short. Go ahead. It's the year 3579 on the planet Gaza. People are very rich, but they haven't abandoned their spiritual life. On this red planet, at the Science and Theology High School, are two inseparable friends, Nietzsche and Fasim. At night in the dormitory, they slip under the covers side by side, and through the 
crystal ceiling, they watch the blue snowflakes disintegrating like decomposing planets. One day, they meet a beautiful virgin named Ishra. At first sight, they both fall madly in love with her. They realize that one of them will have to die, since they can't both love the same girl. So, they promise each other that whoever dies first will come back, no matter from how many light years away, to tell the other what's in the next world. One evening, Neji finds the bullet-ridden body of his friend Fasil. One year later, he marries Ishra. And another night, they shine an interplanetary spotlight on the city of Kars and make love like crazies. Suddenly, a TV turns on, and Fasil's face, full of bullet holes, appears on the screen. Expose my killer! Until he is punished, there will be no peace for me, either in this world or the next. And then the ghost disappeared. Yet? And what happens next? Well, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> well, what do you think? Do you think it will sell? Do you think that this life is only preparation for the next life? Well, not exactly. Allah also wants us to be happy here. And now, in this life, it's, it's very complicated. Who is Ishram? It's not her real name. She's the leader of the Headscarf Girls, a rebel. Before, she was a model in Istanbul. She was even on TV. She shoved her bottom in her legs. She came to cars to do a commercial for Fendak Shampoo. First, she made fun of it. to my friend Ajit, theology student and science fiction novelist. Before I actually met them, I was sure I'd make fun of them, or 
Let's say I approach them with a wicked curiosity. And then? They became my classmates. I put myself in their shoes. For years, their fathers and mothers told them, cover your head, and all of a sudden they're told, uncover your head, what the government wants. So then one day, I covered my head. Out of political solidarity. I was brave, but it was fun. I'm the daughter of an atheist, a man in perpetual protest. I only wanted to do it for a day. One revolutionary gesture, an act of freedom. But everyone came down so hard on me, the police, the state, journalists. I couldn't just walk away from it. They arrested us for demonstrating without a permit. If I had spent the next day leaving prison, I give up. I never believed anyway. All cars would have spat in my face. Before I was an atheist like you, and God put me through this to set me on the right path. Don't look at me like that. You're looking at me like you pity me. Not looking at you like I pity you? Yes, you are. <laughs> know that I don't feel any more ridiculous than you are, or superior. What about your father? What does he say? My father is against the veil. He's afraid of prison, but he supports us 100% because we're opposing the state. Tonight, one of my friends, Anna, who also wears a headscarf, is coming over. She wants to take it off because of the pressure, but she can't make herself go through with it. And your father? Does he ever leave those up? Rarely. What's your astrological sign? <laughs> Gemini? They say Geminis lie a lot, but I'm not sure about that. You're not sure Geminis lie a lot, or do you lie a lot? If you believe in astrology, then you might know why today is important for me. My sister told me, wrote a poem. Does your sister tell you everything? Here we have two pastimes, talking and watching TV. Sometimes we do both at the same time. My sister really is beautiful, isn't she? Yes. <coughs> She's really beautiful. You're beautiful. Are you going to tell her that too? No. <coughs> that would be our secret. A secret is the best way to start a friendship. stage of the National Theater, <coughs> Ka reads his poem, encouraged by applause. Pantomime of Sunai Zayin's My Fatherland or My Scarf. The actress, Funda Esser, enters, covered head to toe, before revealing her belly dancer costume underneath. She dances provocatively. The religious high schoolers boo and shout insults. Two actors of Sunai's company, dressed as bearded Islamists, arrive to kill Funda. They are chased off by Sunai. Soldiers arrive on stage, take aim at the audience, and fire. Screams. Later, bodies lie under sheets on stage, watched by armed military guards. Ka lifts a sheet, recognizes Najib's body. He lifts it up by the shoulders and kisses it. The military coup has succeeded. Sunai Zayim, allied with the army, has taken control of the city. Scene 14, makeshift military headquarters. Every day, the ego of melancholy spreads its wings in my soul. 
but I'm still standing. So, get a hold of yourself. All's well that ends. Well, you know. Those idiots in Istanbul and Ankara who call themselves journalists tried to say that we had lost the public labor, but we never gave up. And it all wasn't always easy. <coughs> Some years, the worst years, we would show up in these miserable little towns where we couldn't find a place to perform, much less a place to sleep. So we would go from door to door looking for someone, somewhere who seemed sympathetic to modern art. In those moments, the eagle in my chest would ruffle its feathers, and it seemed like it would suffocate me. But I resisted. We'd perform anywhere, sidewalks, streets, empty classrooms, anywhere. I devoted 10 years of my life trying to pull my brothers out of despair. The guys thrown in jail by calling us communists, Western agents, Jehovah's Witnesses, pimps, prostitutes. They tortured us, stoned us. But they learned to love my plays. <coughs> they tasted the freedom and the happiness of theater. A great actor has in him, like a grain of sand, the untapped power that has accumulated through the centuries. And he keeps within him the lessons he has absorbed. His mastery of himself is exceptional. No one can guess at his power before he appears on stage. And all his life, on the barest of stages or the most lavish of sets, he searches for the path that would lead him to true freedom. And if he's lucky enough to find it, he must follow it fiercely to the end. Hegel, 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 the philosopher, was the first to remark that history and theater was made of the same plot. As in theater, history distributes roles. And like actors who risk everything in performance, only the bravest step onto the stage of history. So when the snowstorm hit cars, blocking the roads and stranding the prefect in Gertzuhum, I knew it was the chance of a lifetime for my theater company to join forces with the army for my art and I to ride ourselves into history. And I will not let that opportunity pass me by. <coughs> In three days, when the snow has melted, the state is going to demand an explanation. Not because blood was spilled, but because they weren't the ones to spill it. And the people of cars will hate you. You and your scary play. What will you do then? I'm not afraid of that. As for the people of cars, we could hang someone on TV to make an example of them, and they sit there like statues. They're practically frozen already. We know that the Islamists are preparing suicide attacks. If you hang someone, you'll only encourage more terrorism. Funda <coughs> Ezer, celebrated actress and my wife. Now, let's talk as friends. Why didn't you point out anyone when the police showed you the suspects? I didn't recognize anyone. Seeing how much you cared for that boy in Eugene who took you to Blue, the soldiers wanted to arrest you. You arrived in Germany exactly one day before the coup, and you happened to be at the exact location where the director was killed. Makes you look a little suspicious. The 
They wanted to bring you in for questioning. I stopped them. Thank you for that. No one understands why you kissed the dead body of the boy who brought you to Blue. I don't know. He was innocent. Sincere. I thought he'd live for a hundred years. The police also put microphones in Sheikh Badatin's house. You kissed his hand, you were in tears, explaining how you believed in God. No one understands why you did that. Lots of leftist poets are becoming religious in a panic before the Islamists take power. You'd be ashamed, wouldn't you, if the Europeans saw what we do? Do you know how many people they hanged to be able to found the modern world you admire so much? Ataturk strung up a boatload of dreamers like you on day one and kicked this through your head. The religious high schoolers you saw today in prison, they memorized your face. They throw their bombs on anybody, anything, to make themselves heard. What's more, because you read your poem, very modern, at, at the performance yesterday, they think you were part of the plot. No westernized person can breathe easy in this country without a secular army to protect them, especially not the condescending intellectuals. Without an army, the religious fanatics would chop them into little pieces. When they've turned this country into a second Iran, do you really think they'll remember the weak-hearted liberal who shed tears over you, a young Islamist? When that day comes, they'll kill you because you're westernized. Because you don't say Bismillah when you're afraid, or because you wear a tie. That coat. Yeah, that coat is beautiful. Where did you buy that? Can I wear it on a stage? Oh, of course. Oh, well, just so you don't end up with holes in your nice coat, I'm going to give you a bodyguard. After that, I'll announce the curfew on television. There are no terrorists in cars that you could be afraid of. Don't kid yourself. The only way for them to take power is terrorism, and they know it. Every time, our fears turn out to be well-founded. If we don't let the army take care of these fanatics, we'll be sent back to the Dark Ages. I was just like you when I was young. I wandered the streets of Nishantash and Beyolu. I ate up Western films. I read everything by Sartre and Zola. And I believed Europe was our future. To see our world destroy itself. See our sisters forced to cover their heads. See poems banned because they were impious. How can you be indifferent to all that? You are from my world. No one else in Paris has read T.S. Eliot. What do you want from me? Tell me, now. If I were not here, you could not stay alive in this city. Slatter the religious fanatics all you want. You would still find, up, find yourself with holes in your coat. In Kars, I am your only protector. Without my friendship, you'd find yourself trembling in a jail cell after being tortured. Your friends. Jumuriyet. Don't believe in you. They believe in the army. I know that. In that case, confess what you hid from the police this morning. Being here, I've started to believe in God. But it's possible that I'm still hiding it from myself. You're delusional! Your God is not their God. You can't believe like a poor person without being one of them. If you eat what they eat, if you live among them, if what angers them angers you, then you can believe in their God. But that's not the issue. In a half an hour, I'm going on television to speak to the people of cars. I want to tell them some good news. I'll tell them that the director's assassin has been arrested. Can I tell them that you identified this person? But I didn't identify anyone. What are we going to do with our poet, whose 
whose soul is in Europe, whose heart is with the religious high schoolers, and whose head is all mixed up. He's a good boy. <coughs> you can see it in his face. He'll, he'll help us. But he cries over Islam. He's in love. Only a true poet can worry about love during a revolution. Oh, this one's not a true poet, he's a true lover. Listen to me. And understand that the smartest thing you can do for yourself is to help us. Hattie is Blue's mistress. Blue didn't come to Paris for politics, but for love. He disappeared in the blink of an eye before the operation la last night. He's somewhere in Paris, and he will contact you again. So, I suggest wearing a microphone and a transmitter in your coat, so you have nothing to fear in terms of your safety. And as soon as you leave, you'll arrest him. You hide your hand well. You should watch out for Hattie. She reports everything back to Blue, even what guests say at her father's dinner table. She's head over heels for Blue. What is it that's so exceptional about this person anyway? Hattie? What? Of course not. Blue. Why does everyone in the world end up falling over this assassin? Why is he a legend? Can you explain this fascination to me? I'll take you back to your hotel in the truck. I prefer to walk home. If you don't mind. Kyle exits. A plainclothes police officer follows him. Scene 15. Hotel Kaupalas with Kadife. Room 217. Secret room. Do the police know we're here? Don't be afraid. I'm sure they have some poor staff following you, but for now, they don't know we're here. Eventually they'll know. But as of right now, we're free here. It'll be our only moment of freedom in cars, so enjoy it. Take off your coat. Oh, this coat protects me from evil. Plus, it's cold. Steve isn't scared of you. He wants to make you scared of it. Is there someone behind me? I forgot to look. Fall in love and lose all sense? Sorry. We're all afraid. Make my sister happy. She's a good person. Do you think she loves me? Of course she loves you. She must love you. You're a very attractive man. Plus, you're done and I like her. Do you think she'll follow me to Germany? She thinks you're very handsome, but she doesn't trust you. Trust takes time. Impatient men like you don't love a woman, they appropriate her. Did she really tell you that? In this city, we never have time. Blue has a very important message for you. I'm being followed. They'll arrest him. We'll all be tortured. There, there was a raid in the house. Blue, no. The police hear everything he says. Blue, no, he's being tapped. But before the coup, his message to the West was keep your nose out of our suicides. Now that there are more important matters at hand, he wants to send a new message. It's impossible to get anywhere in the city without being seen. But there's a truck. It comes twice a day for delivery with the kitchen door, which gives out onto the courtyard. Then it finishes the round. There's a tarp over the goods. The delivery guy can be trusted. You want me to hide under tarp like a thief? I've hidden there plenty of times. It's funny. Moving around the city without anybody seeing or knowing. If you work with Blue, I'll help you with Ipek. I want her to marry you. Why is that? Who wouldn't want her sister to be happy? OK. 
Okay, I'll, I'll come. But first, tell me why you trust me. You're a dervish. What Blue said. He believes God has given you innocence for life. Does Epek know that God gave me this gift? Why should she know it is Blue who thinks that? Please tell me everything that Epek thinks of me. I already told you everything. Trust me. In the first instance, or the first ten minutes, the woman knows what kind of man she's dealing with, who he is, if she'll love him. Her head needs time to catch up to what her heart has decided. In my opinion, during this period, the man doesn't have to do much with it. You still insist on doing something. Tell her all the nice things you feel about her. Why you love her. Why you want to marry her. Tell me the name of the movie theater where you might take her in Frankfurt. Film Forum Höchst. Don't the Germans have any theaters called Alhambra? <laughs> Ruya? Majesty? Oh, yes, yes. Um, El Dorado. I did some theater in Istanbul when I was in school. Once, they offered me the role of a veiled girl in a German-Turkish co-production. Attitude. You and Ipek will be happy in Germany. My sister was made to be happy, but she doesn't know it. it destroyed her not to have a child.
and Caripe leave and slip under the tarp. Scene 20, in blue cell after he is arrested by Sunai Zain's men. Ka gives Blue a pack of Marlboros. So, good sir, who are you spying for today? I've given up spying. Now I'm an intermediary. That's even worse. Spies deliver information wholesale, which is useless most of the time. Intermediaries, on the other hand, pretend to be neutral. And they meddle in things that don't concern them. What's your interest in all this? To get out of this awful city safe and sound. <laughs> oh, right now only Sunai would trust an atheist from the West here to spy on us. What are you mediating today? Your freedom. In exchange, Sunai wants Khalifa to act in his play tonight at the National she will have her head covered like a Spanish woman. Then, disgusted by the honor killings in the play, she'll take off her headscarf. If you accept, soon I will let you go. So this is my only chance of salvation? Yes. Your head is worth a high price. Thank you. Tell him that I refuse. If you fail in your mediation and don't succeed in escaping the city, it won't be my fault. It will be because of you, bragging about your atheism. In this country, you can't brag about being an atheist unless you've got the army behind you. I didn't brag about being an atheist. I'm happy to hear it. And you, you're not afraid of dying? Your question is a threat I'm not afraid. in to all their demands. These murderers wouldn't keep their word. They want me to confess to crimes I didn't commit. And maybe they'll pardon me with their repentance law. I always pity the idiots who let themselves be fooled by those lies. The last minute they abandon the causes they defended and betray their entire lives. Before I die, I want those who come after me to know the truth about me. On February 20th, the day of my execution, I declare that I do not regret any of my political acts. My childhood was spent in the quiet, unassuming world of my father, who secretly frequented a Sufi community. Wanting to expose my father, I became a left-wing atheist. I married, then I separated. Because of my rage against the West, I admired the revolution in Iran and became a Muslim again. I believed Imam Khomeini when he said, it is more important today to defend Islam with weapons in hand than to pray and fast. I escaped to Germany after the military coup. I was wounded in my right foot at Grozny, fighting alongside the Chechens. When I was in Bosnia during the Serbian siege, I married a young Bosnian named Mzuka. I left her too. I couldn't stay more than two weeks in the same city because of my political activities. I think it is sometimes necessary to kill the enemies of Islam. but. As of today, I have neither killed nor ordered the killing of anyone. I came to Kars because of the young women committing suicide. Suicide is the worst of sins. My poems are my testament, and I desire that they be published. You don't have to die. 
That's why I'm here, in Munich. I saw a film with Marlon Brando. Burn. Black slaves who worked sugarcane fields revolt. They're subdued and the leader is arrested. The morning used to be hanged. The representative of the colonists, Marlon Brando, bursts into the tent where he's being held prisoner and he frees him. But the slave refuses to escape. Why? He understands that if they hang him, he will become a legend. And the natives will brandish his name like a flag of the revolt for years to come. So they hang him? Yes, but they don't show the hanging. Instead, we see Marlon Brando, the agent who tried to free him, get murdered. I'm not an agent. Don't get so hung up on the word agent. I'm an agent too. An agent of Islam. I'm nobody's agent. They wouldn't have put anything in this Marlboro to weaken my resolve, would they? <laughs> These Marlboro Reds are the best thing the Americans have given the world. <laughs> Smoke them to the end of my days. If you think this goo, you could spend the next 40 years smoking Marlboro. That's exactly what I mean when I call you an agent. This type of blackmail is what an agent does. Listen, it would be completely absurd to let yourself be killed by these fascists. You're never going to be a revolutionary icon. Revolutionaries like you get their bodies tossed into the sea from helicopters. These people are like lambs. They're attached to their religion. But in the end, they obey the government. Barely 20% vote for the Islamists. If Islamists only have 20% of the votes, then why did the armies make a coup? Say it, since you're an impartial intermediary. I am impartial. No! No, you are an agent of the West! A slave to the Europeans, a slave who refuses freedom, and like all slaves, you don't even know you are a slave. I can offer you a solution. Katika can wear a wig under her scarf, so when she takes it off, no one will see her hair. You will not make me drink wine. I am writing my own story. I don't pretend to be a European, and I'm not going to make a deal with you. I have another idea. The National Theater will be empty. First, the camera will show Kali Bey with her hand on her scarf. Then, with an editing trick, they'll show someone else's hair. <laughs> I find it suspicious that you would go through much, so much trouble to save me. I've never felt so happy in my life, and I want to preserve this happiness. It is a gift from God to want to share one's happiness with a person who's about to be executed. Let's say that I accept your offer so that you can leave this city safe and happy. And if Cotton Bay acts in Sunai's play so as not to compromise her sister's happiness, what guarantee is that they'll let me go? I, I knew you would ask that. Ka puts his finger to his lips, unbuttons his blazer, and makes a show of turning off the recording device under his sweater. I promise you they will free you first. Khalife won't get on stage until you can assure her that you've been free. But for her to agree, I need you to write out the terms of your agreement first. Lou hands him one of the sheets of paper on the table. in which she will take off her headscarf without compromising her honor. If you find the trade, or if you do not keep your word, what will be your punishment? That whatever happens to you will happen to me. Okay, write it down. <clears throat> if Kaike agrees, you'll be freed in a manner of your choosing before she takes off her headscarf. 
Write all that down. Decide where and how you will be released. Carl turns the recorder under his sweater back on in an obvious way. Without a minimum level of trust, we're not going to reach an agreement. You have to believe that the government will keep its promise. Do you think how many people agree to the plan? She'll agree. Talk to me about your happiness. I've never loved anyone like this. Epec is my last chance to be happy. What is happiness? Finding a world which makes you forget the emptiness and oppression. To hold someone in your arms as if they're the whole world. Carl, struck with inspiration, writes the poem, Chess Game. For years I couldn't write anymore. In cars, all the channels of poetry have reopened. I'm reconnected to the love of God. I don't want to shatter your illusions, but your love of God comes out of Western romanticism. <clears throat> Here, if you believe in God like a European, you're ridiculous. And you can't seriously believe that you actually believe. You don't belong to this country. You aren't even a Turk anymore. First try being like everybody else, then try believing in God. Do you have a message for Khalifa? Be careful. You might become a target. Whether it's here or in your beloved Europe, you'll always be on your hands and knees in front of them. Being happy is enough for me. All right, go away. And get this in your head. If you only look for happiness, you'll never find it. Scene 21, makeshift military headquarters. So this guy wants to be freed before Kajife takes off her head shot. He's no idiot. Kalife wants the same thing. We are the state now! Why should we trust them? You are staging this coup for the beauty of art, aren't you? All your life, you fought for political art. If you want to commit an ordinary political act, then don't breathe blue before the show. But if you think that Kalife taking off her scarf in front of cars will be an artistic and political act of the highest order, then you have to do it. Sunaide. Uh, all my life in my cassette, I've reported events that came true. But I don't know anything about the theater. So, um, write me an article about your play tonight, and tomorrow's paper will be perfect. <coughs> Take this down. <coughs> Headline. Death on stage. Subhead. Famous actor Sunai Zain slain during play last night. Introduction. Last night, during the historic performance at the National Theater, Kajipi, known as a headscarf girl, was overtaken by the spirit of the Enlightenment and tore off her veil before firing her loaded gun at Sunai Zain, the famous <coughs> villain. End of introduction. Having arrived in our city three days ago as emissaries of the Enlightenment, Sunai Zaim and his theater company's revolutionary work has shaped our very lives. In the lit latest play adapted from English author Thomas Kidd, a known influence on Shakespeare, Sunai Zaim conveyed his theatrical vision as a conduit 
of the Enlightenment. After more than 20 years of Herculean, Herculean. Herculean effort and superhuman labor in the forgotten villages of Anatolia. In the heightened emotional world of this modern and audacious, audacious. <laughs> drama, Kadifi, the outspoken leader of the so-called headscarf girls, took off her veil on stage and fired multiple shots at the play's symbol of evil, Sunai Zain's character. The great Turkish man of theater, Sunay Zaim, was, like Kid, little recognized during his lifetime. But his on-stage death was a tragedy for the audience more devastating than life itself. While the audience understood that the play was about a young woman liberating herself from tradition, they could not accept that Sunai Zaim was really dying. So much a man of the theater that he continued to act, bullets riddled and gushing blood to the end. But he will never forget his final words, nor the gift he made of his life. I will publish it exactly as it is. For the first time, as someone who has predicted dozens of events, I, I will pray this one doesn't come to pass. Now, dear sir, surely you're not going to die. I have tried to push theatrical truth to its limit, to the point beyond myth. Tomorrow, once the roads have opened and the snow has melted, my death will no longer mean anything so to the people of Kars. Good, sir of the Gazette, we have done our work. Go prepare your newspaper. I accept Blue and Caddy Bay's journeys. In the street, Ka is captured by soldiers and taken roughly to the police, where intelligence officers tie him to a chair. Demirko, a former military officer, has his soldiers beat up Ka. When Ka refuses to reveal the whereabouts of Blue, Demirko tells him that Ipek was Blue's mistress four years ago, before Blue's relationship with Kadike by playing audio clips of ta tapped phone conversations between Epec and Blue. He also reveals that Epec and Blue have called each other three times in the last two days. Scene 23, Hotel Kaupalas. We will never be happy! Yes, we will. We'll go to Frankfurt and then we'll be happy. I know about your relationship with Blue. Told you about it? Hasim Bey had his men beat me up to your phone conversation that been tapped for past four years. I heard everything! I can vomit up my life! It's been over for a long time. You're leaving with me so you can forget him. It's true, I was very much in love with him, but that's done. I want to go with you to Frankfurt. How in love were you with him? I was very in love. How much? Maybe that's because you were never with 
with another man besides Mukhtar. Turkish women don't often have the opportunity to meet men. You must have plenty of women in Europe. I'm Turkish too! Be Turkish an excuse for bad behavior. The reason you want to go to Frankfurt is to forget him. I can't fall in love in two days. If we leave together, I will fall in love with you very quickly. <laughs> Don't ruin your heart with your Turkish jealousy. I will love you. So you don't love me. You're still in love with Blue. What is so special about him? I can't be with you unless you can really hear what I'm about to say. Blue is affectionate, thoughtful, and generous. He doesn't want to hurt anyone, but he won't stand for his justice. That's the only bad thing that can be said about him. But he's a murderer. That's ridiculous. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He has the heart of a child. He loves telling stories and doing impressions, playing all the roles. He's eloquent and very funny. No, give, give me my love. Don't cry. It's over. My love. Scene 25, at the National Theater, on stage, The Spanish Tragedy. Cadi Bey advances from a distance, in traditional Spanish dress with a headscarf and a small lace veil over her face. She is followed by Sulay Zain, who stops behind her. Cadi Fay tears off the lace veil and tosses it to the side, then slowly removes her headscarf and tosses it to the side as well. What beautiful hair. I'm jealous of the man. Hadifi takes out a gun and fires at Sinai. He crumples, saying, they will never understand modern art. <laughs>
director. Sometimes trying to remember some words uh, that, of course, this is a novel I, that I wrote and my memory is good. I am remembering. So I remember what I said in the original, but in my memory, strange in the sense that I forget that drum. What happens first? What did he do? Why does he do this? While the poetry or the words or what they say to each other, um, um, I remember. Also, um, um, the an adaptation by Blandin and Wapka is really covers the best parts. We had little arguments. Oh, please don't take that off. Please don't take it. No, I, in the end, uh, um, don't know what is kept inside. I'm not following that closely. But I attend uh, um, uh, uh, um, the event, the first in Strasbourg. And I, it was the same thing. I had a sense that the first part is more funny. Uh, and the ending is sometimes get to be too serious and pretentious. And also, uh, the enlightened, pretentious views of Sunai Zayn, uh, uh, well played here, but I will sometimes wonder whether the audiences get, get that, because they're also like Sunai Zayn. <laughs> Nobody enjoyed the jokes about the enlightened, pretentious Sunai Zayn. The audience should be or a bit different than what if you play in the same game? Well, um, actually, in your novel, but also in the play of this theater, is uh, at the center. You also in the novel make reference to Moliere and Brecht and uh, the place where you go. But what does theater mean to you? Not much. I'm a normal person. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for 
given the opportunity to be, to be critical, as they say. Uh, and while on that, uh, if we start, I can write a book on this. My father took us to um, um, bourgeois Michantachet theaters in early 1960s, where we, we were considered waiting, or sometimes wore a necktie on Sunday afternoon and watched their whole play. Um, so I, get, I watched, went to a lot of a lot to theaters when it was also important event in the world or in Europe or in Turkey. Uh, that in my early 20s, when I was alone, didn't have a girlfriend, I used to go to a taxi modern state, the, uh, uh, the government state theater, had to see adaptations of Chekhov or Shakespeare, or I remember uh, watching Max Frisch on Dora. Uh, by myself on the floor, oh, the best seat, everything. I was very happy. In 1972, a very long play, very interesting. Mm -hmm. if, if in the novel, as well as the uh, adapted uh, play, there's that line of Hegel and that theater and history but made of the Again, same material. Is so, is that um, the line, or one of those, or do you think this is, uh, this is how it is? No. That Sunak Zayni design, with his pretentious enlightened earth, voices speaking. I am not Sunak Zayn, please. <laughs> Sunak, Sunak Zayn is a drama, is a drama man. And he has, as we know, he has got all his pretensions because of some of the things that he believed in, I also believed in. But uh, in the end, he is, he wants some um, light of importance for falling on him. So he picks up Hegel saying, you know, I mean, as important as Hegel, uh, Hegel's uh, view of history, and he's saying things, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that theater, um, uh, I would not say that theater is a stage and the history is a stage there equal. In the end, theater is also literature, and we have to be modest about it. Um, I had a question about the tone. I, what I admire so much in the novel is the lightness, even just so very, very serious. How did you, how did you find that there is, or is that? Yes, in, in fact, that I also, um, um, that finding that uh, it's not voice, in fact, let's call it tone. Find, uh, finding <coughs> that tone uh, helped me to write this novel. I've been, like many of my novels, I've been thinking about the novel for many years, uh, about that to associate the Turkey's serious dramatical problems of modernism, tradition, democracy, um, egalitarianism, so for, uh, and also tradition and Islam. Let's put tradition and Islam here, and modernism and democracy are this year, and Turks are arguing and arguing about it. So I wanted to write something about all, but uh, <coughs> so serious, so, uh, I have to find a light tone. If it's so serious, then you would be in a position to dramatize, dramatize, and make dramatical big state, uh, statements about what's happening. I don't want that. I want to say to my readers, Turkish international, that, that in fact at the focus, uh, that uh, why don't you have it some distance to this fight you're having here? You're very similar to each other. Um, maybe partly my peaceful liberal attitude, uh, partly because I was also harassed by this kind of authoritarian voices being on the secular side, being on the traditional side. Um, um, on the, uh, so I wanted to cover everything, but in a light way. And it just didn't happen once. For example, uh, um, that one day I, I was planning to write this novel for many years. One day I saw in a magazine that there was an interview with a, a young Islamist who said that he was writing a science first, science Islamic science fiction novel. <laughs> that, uh, thank you. I improved it. I improved the limits. So I made the planets Ghazali planets, and it is so forth and so on. So I pick up the humor from reality that is, um, that of course is not humorous. But, uh, for example, this guy who travels from Kokat. Uh, they actually was from Yozda to another place and shot a professor. That was also in the news. Whether to look at it in a humorous way is yes, my crime of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when it happens, you look at it not with humor, you cry. Mm -hmm. 
but that's yeah. it's finding finding this balance. But on the other hand, uh, when it's staged, uh, the um, um, the text or is also a possibility of overdoing things or underdoing things. It's a matter of such fine tuning, which I see today works a lot. There are some problems, you know, I want to see this, take notes, but I, generally speaking, I was very happy about the uh, balance of seriousness and humor. And towards the end, I think it was a bit uh, sumizaiyim's uh, pretensions were not uh, understood. They are not uh, in yet. The audience should laugh at those moments, and they were not laughing. <laughs> 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 Talking too, too serious, maybe. Uh, so, uh, isn't that, that, that great French philosopher Monsieur who says art actually is an anticipation um, of the future? We are already late. Whatever we think now already has happened. You know that only artists are only to see uh, or, or get a feeling, an atmosphere, and prepare us. I don't know exactly when you started writing it, and this kind of this powder cake, that pressure cooker, those three days there. How do you, looking back at it, how many years ago was first? It was, of course, Carl spent three days. Thomas, but I spent more than three days. Again, I'm not Carl. I went, and uh, the idea to write a novel uh, it, it was to write a novel about Turkey, making a small uh, town. Uh, um, cut off from Tur uh, the rest of Turkey, so that there will be a military coup, and it will be a sort of a, a, a little place on its own for a while. Then I need it. Then I thought this can also, uh, only be done if that place is too cold, it snows, and this happens in Turkey, that the roads are blocked, you know, and, and the place is independent for a while. So I thought I built to little, a small town of Kars, northern eastern Turkey, once. Um, so I thought, maybe I'll go there. And then my coincidence helped. Some major Turkish newspaper want, wanted me to be a columnist. At that time, I published in my name is written, and they introduced me. Like, uh, you make columnist for us? No. But you should be a press guy and call your friends at Kars so that police won't pick up the phone to that or you to understand what I'm doing there. And he said, OK, I'll arrange that. And after I, he arranged that, I went there. And exactly like what happens to Kars, went around to the governor, this or that, they announced that I'm there. So suddenly, my visit to Kars, to power there were really elections, uh, 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 my visit to Kars turned out to be something uh, um, important because it will be published in Turkish national newspapers. That was local elections then. It was not elections all Turkey, so they were exaggerating that. So everyone, all the parties who wanted to say something to Turkey then, Everyone called me, we also want to talk to you. Fundamentalist party called, this party called, so I, I felt like a diplomat. But it was fun because everyone was giving material for my love. <laughs> <laughs> and they were enthusiastic about it. Yeah. And in fact, they were right. Yeah, the novel is a cut and paste balancing of all the, what, they want, of, uh, what they wanted me to write. Of course, I also wrote my ideas. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, I think we had just had Michael Frame is a, a playwright and he said in a good play, everybody's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so what you and what you do. So um, um, what I said uh, about uh, uh, the, um, the tone, it's about I feel of first love in a way to play about what they remember and they were happy as they had life. And also about the father figure, you know, which is kind of the series, kind of, she doesn't want to make love, and the father in love, and the father's in the house, she can't leave to Frankfurt because the father is there. And we don't really see him, but he's hanging um, over it. Is that um, 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 a general you know, observation you have on the single is that figure is so strong? You also mentioned Hamlet. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think the father is strong. The idea of the father may be strong in the play of the novel. But the father, if I can tell you, father is, I think, extremely weak. He has liberal ideas, but, uh, 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 but um, uh, while his daughters are uh, um, happy with Islam, fundamentalism, uh, um, uh, and he, he says A and does B, I don't think they, uh, they are afraid of him. In fact, I also have a little criticism of this scene where, uh, at the end of the play novel or whatever, um, they, Ka and Kadife uh, uh, 
are talking, um, Ipe are talking, arguing in love. Um, maybe I'll talk about this later. Uh, um, I decided to, to blend in privately. Um, 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 but what was your question? <laughs> The father who seems so in a pain like that, yeah. the father. But in, in, in fact, all the decisions of the survivors, the, the, the women who survive, a lot of it is actually it's about him, which is surprising. <coughs> about father? About father, not to you know to stay, not to go back. So so she kind of. Um, yes, but maybe you're right. But I don't. Um, I don't. Um, I don't see Ipek and Kadife's father as an authoritarian father. Though there are many, many, <coughs> an average Turkish father. He is less authoritarian than average Turkish father. This is how I feel. Mm -hmm. So um, and they are not afraid of their father. Uh, these are, relatively speaking, liberated girls. What do we mean by liberation? We can discuss. But they are strong girls. Definitely, their father did not crush them. I saw a lot of crushed um, girls in Turkey who their fathers were strong. Here we have a, a weak father where the girls are strong. This is how I think of them. But you may say that, okay, father led patriarchal society as Turkey is, but this father does not represent that father. <coughs> or is not, is not that father. Um, I think in, in, in one of your um, writings, you said you read rather in over example how to be a painter and uh, before. Or you saw you're taking so many photos. Um, um, and the, why do you write? So why do you write? Well, thank you. And most of the time, amateurs ask this question. Yes. So I'm very happy to hear that I wrote a uh, man uh, um, uh, uh, a lecture in Stockholm. I uh, delivered I, uh, um, two pages of explain why I write. First, uh, there is no one single question that we write. <coughs> to honor, to address many sentiments we have. And many people think that we write for one reason. And we write for many, many reasons. Sometimes we are angry, sometimes politics, sometimes we write because we started a novel, sometimes there's another reason, sometimes just to be alone, we don't, we don't want to work in an office. So forth and so on. There are not one single reason. Maybe we take questions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> You made the remark, if I remember right, when it was you, that looking at the problems also in the Middle East, and they are like two ends of this Shakespearean, one could be Shakovian, who could end in a, oh, yes. in, a, in a bloodbath, you know, or people survive, but they're extremely unhappy. Um, so what, uh, looking at the very big picture of the world we are in, what, 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 what are thoughts you have from, at the moment? Oh, well, uh, um, um, display is, in a way, both has um, drama, uh, so maybe Shakespearean, and also it's, uh, as they say about Chekhov, a play of atmosphere where there's a father and no one is in that sense very strong, they have all mistakes, this or that. And also I, uh, I like the Chekhovian norm, maybe they like questions, you know. <laughs> so yeah, let's go to question, maybe let's put up uh, some little bit of light in the audience and if possible, uh, uh, really, uh, 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 questions and not comments and not, uh, you know, and really perhaps also focusing a bit on yes, the um, on the stage. So um, one there's one, question. two, and where, where there was a third one here somewhere. I'm so where? So, but we start over here, and we have a microphone since we're recording it, and you can bring it over. Or gay people, yeah. First, thank you very much for really wonderful evening. I enjoyed very much your text, and in a way I could relate what was happening in the, around me, the country that you described, with my country, rather your big country, we're a very small country. So I saw this play as a question of identity, identity, individual identity of the individuals, and also the, the identity of the country. So my question, so you were very critical about the influences that the West has on your country. At least I didn't see in the text anything positive that is coming from the West. Okay. Oh, well, that's that's the question you said, yeah. I have to be yeah. Yeah. critical of your question. So, this is his character. But maybe just into the question part. So, what is the question? The Turkey is a big nation, and certainly you can 
uh, model, define your identity, and protect it. I come from a nation of Macedonians. So, so like, what's the question yeah. where <laughs> the big countries are trying to destroy that identity and to erase how we can protect our identity? Yeah, but that's not my problem. I didn't like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is also. I was thinking, I started saying something else, but what, what was that? <laughs> I be lost. I mean, it is. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the next question. It was over here. Yes. One, a brief question. Sure. Uh, if I was not mistaken, you were full time living in Turkey when you were writing this snow novel. Yes. Uh, and if I, again, if not, if I not was mistaken, if I wasn't mistaken, you said that after writing this, you wouldn't write any political novel after snow. Yes, but I said this is, uh, okay, but you asked the question. I didn't ask. If I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, yeah, we, we, if the question, okay, very the question fast. is, you, in today's Turkey, would you even think of, think of writing a novel like snow in today's? Yes, yes, I can. Still? Uh, yes. Um, um, uh, um, you said, uh, uh, um, that I did, would not write a political novel after this. That's a misconception. I, I said this many times uh, uh, before I published this novel to, uh, to point out the fact that political novel is a very limited genre. I will explain why I think so. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's not very interesting. In the end, I wrote this novel uh, as standout set to put a mirror to the political situation in, in Turkey. All the parties are there, all the groups are there, secularists, army, uh, liberals, uh, a bit softer leftists, uh, softer rightists, harder rightists, fundamentalists, nationalists, Turks, all the spectrum, all the, all the Turkish parties are there. And I wanted to write a novel, uh, and also there were things at that time and still are, that seemed so obvious to me, but I didn't understand why people didn't acknowledge that. that uh, so I wanted to dramatize all the things that I want to say about Turkish politics at that time, and still I can uh, do that kind of thing uh, today too. But then, <coughs> I'm not saying, President so-and-so, you're bad, or uh, uh, Ahmed Bey, or this party bad. I'm not saying that, I'm so showing and the novel that you cannot write with because of, they say, is, uh, and that cannot be done. That one cannot do. That there is not free speech, political free speech in Turkey. That is definite. But when I wrote this novel, there was not true that this novel uh, was not picked up and attacked. When I wrote this novel, that, um, that free speech or you could defend the Kurds or at that time there were victims of uh, Islamists. Uh, um, you can talk about this in a very hard way. The novel is full of people, full of people, as we have seen, who are put into prison. At that time, Turkey was not more free than today. Today, Turkey is not, we don't have free speech today. And at that time, it was also, everyone was put in, with some excuse into jail. That's a long tradition. <laughs> Maybe one or two more uh, questions, um, if there is one. Maybe from our uh, drama talk, maybe uh, tell, tell, oh, London, London, uh, what was the experience for you to, to work here in New York? And uh, you just are here from uh, months and a half of performing in China. How was your experience of uh, um, creating it here as New York actors? So. Okay. In China, it was a, um, I can say, a big adventure and very big experience for us because we were. We didn't expect the reaction of the, the audience, you know. What was the reaction? Um, it depends on towns, you know. But <coughs> has, because of the, I can say it's a topic subject, for, I think for them in, uh, in China, and because of the, of the, of the problem with the Uyghur in the China, we were very prudent, you know, and we were a little bit scared at the beginning, especially in Shanghai, but because, you know, we know that there was a lot of intellectual what problem, they, they came to see the play, and, but we were surprised in a good way about the reaction, because 
mostly the, the people who are coming to see the audience, I can say that they were quite young, between 20 and 28. So when you are coming from Europe, we dream this kind of uh, audience, young audience. And we were surprised for one thing, because you know in China the audience is not quiet like in Western. So at the beginning I have to, to, to give some words to tell them to, to put down and to switch their phones and things like this. But after that we were so surprised by this, because it was it's three, four hours, you know, with the intermission. And we were playing big theater, 1,500 people. And so at the intermission, okay, we lose maybe 200 or, uh, people because people, they were coming um, with their parents. Their parents were coming with, sometimes with small girls and uh, with their children. They were thinking maybe snow is a tail. So they were surprised, you know. And so they stay until the intermission and sometimes we really feel that for them it was too strong. Uh, Especially because inside the, the inside the play, the moment of the coup, we we did it uh, by a movie. You know, it's a movie it's, because when I created the play, it was just after the attacks in Paris, uh, after the attack on you know in this theater. So for me and for the team, it was very. Uh, difficult, you know, to... Yes, I also want to say a few things. I also can. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Uh, uh, Frank, uh, um, that um, stage handling, uh, um, um, re -adapta adapting, the adaptation of this book is problematic. Let me give you one example. Um, this scene where the director of the um, uh, uh, school um, and the guy who is uh, this funny scene or whatever dramatical scene that he in the end, um, takes out his gun uh, it was when the book was translated in, um, around, around, I think, uh, um, two, one or two years after 9-11 uh, was very popular in America and also in Europe. Uh, also, I want to say this, that I, uh, I, were, uh, I wrote this novel in 90% before 9-11. In fact, uh, in, in before 9-11, no one knows this, I always tell my friends, you know, before 9-11, there was a good, very well-researched profile of Osama bin Laden in New York. So I also carried that era when I was writing my novel. And in fact, there were two mentions of Osama bin Laden. One, I, I, a little gossip, which was probably true, that I heard from my Turkish journalist friends who were friendly uh, with the state, that Osama bin Laden wanted to organize killing of Russian sex workers who came to Turkey or Ukraine or uh, uh, to, to Turkey uh, uh, and in northern eastern uh, Turkey. Lots of families were whatever. Uh, um, but before I published my two months or three months of planned publication of the novel, Osama bin Laden, it was all around, so I deleted Osama bin Laden out of the novel. And I'm telling all this, people, in, after 9-11, a lot of people thought, oh, something new happened. It's not new. All the controversies here I described are, were old. And, and, but when I saw that small European radio station, or this dialogue between the American killer and the professor, it kept got to be a, a really a, a sort of an essentialist re reproduction of a part of my play um, um, to trash naive, normal Muslims. It got to be that way. So after a while, there were already permissions from my age, and I said, I don't want this to be only this part to be. Uh, used, but they were, they were using it the, the way I did not want it to be used. Uh, Why? Uh, it's very provocative, uh, but on the other hand, the feeling is right. Um, the managing or playing of this novel 
or to me. No, it's a norm. It doesn't change. But when you have a play, you have to adapt. And there are always Islamists are doing something someplace, and then there are always angry voices coming. So while you have here a novel, a play, and in the end, and it is why I say political novel is an impossible genre, because you write novels, or at least I write novels, in which I try to, un uh, try to identify with everyone. That is why people think that when I say, you are a Western spy dating, I'm talking there, or whatever. When I say Bertel Brecht, and then make a crack a joke, they think I'm making fun of Bertel Brecht. No, these characters, I'm trying to see Bertel Brecht, or like in Germany, through the point of view of an exiled Islamist, through the point of, point of view of an exiled leftist, or through the, it, it, so. There are so many points of view in a good novel, and, the, uh, and that author is, the writer's point of view is behind. This is the kind of novel I believe in. But in a political novel, my God, the writer is supposed to take the flag with some of the characters and run ahead. I'm not that kind of person. And that and I don't enjoy, and I don't have friends who, who, uh, who will follow me. I mean, and I don't have <laughs> okay. And if there's no, no, not anyone, then I think you can be a good master. But uh, and that, on the other hand, with that sensibility, you cannot write to the kind of political novel you want that writers write. And um, so, mm -hmm. thank you. Maybe to Tubada as a question. Uh, with, just to finish, in fact, the young generation they were very moved by the play, and sometimes we had meeting with them after the play. Or before, and um, it was very interesting well, because they, not in public, but they stayed with us and they were telling us how they were so surprised that we could say all this thing on stage, you know, so, but, and they, they can really make the links between what's happening in their country and what we were saying on the stage, and they, they really appreciate that around Hamuk and we keep this soul and, soul and this spirit in our uh, stage adaptation, but he was defending each character. Yeah, so in a way like a reverse correction, alienation effect, instead of playing something in China to learn the, tell the Berlin or something, you had something from Turkey and you but went over there. But there is a lot of, there are many, many Muslims in China, not only in Uyghur, yeah. but in other places, in fact, that even this boxer uprising that happened in 1904 in China, and Muslims were also involved in it, and, and part, half of the Chinese government and army was also involved in it, Muslims, Chinese, and what are not? And it was one of the earliest anti-Western, and they were killing in, in Christians in the streets. It was one of the earliest anti-Western uprisings and Muslims were also involved. Muslims in China are not only in Xinjiang, they are all. Thank you. Well, uh, the, um, already it's an incredible task from that novel to condense it to a play. Tonight we had a selection even of the play you were already adoring. Did, did you have something in mind for a New York audience? How did you uh, approach this uh, dramaturgically? Well, the challenge really when you do that, uh, because a novel like Snow is so big, you have to cut in it, and yet at the end, what you are left with for the play must contain the, the soul, the, the, the heart of the novel. And to be frank, we were at the beginning terrified that Oran wouldn't retrieve <laughs> his, his novel in our play. So, uh, yeah, uh, so, so, so this was really the, the biggest challenge for us. Um, so we went through a process of uh, selecting some scenes, we put them together, and we asked ourselves, okay, do we have here, with this selection, which looks like a play, which can tell a story, draw a line through the novel, do we have the, the heart of the novel? Uh, and once we thought that it was the case, we, of course, uh, wrote 
to, to Varane and we asked him for a meeting to start a, a discussion. But yes, we were, we were terrified, really, that... Uh, but it, it has to, is the scene in Asia Hotel is in or out? The scene in Asia Hotel, you mean the, the big discussion uh, to draw a declaration? We okay, this is... Okay, so, so this is a, a very interesting... It's my fault, it's my fault, yes. Uh, okay. so, but it's, uh, it will be good if we fight in front of the audience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Play is maybe it's much more interesting than what happens on stage. Very good. So maybe um, uh, uh, I think we come closer um, to the last question. But what are you working on at the moment? What's your what's oh, keeping you, you busy? Fact, I'm right oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and thank you for the occasion. By the way, thank you so much. I'm writing, of course, another novel. It's very similar to this, and in fact, sort of an answer. But it's a historical novel that I've been thinking. I always say that. I've been thinking about this novel for the last 35 years. All of my other novels are stolen from them. Again, we have a town which is cut off from the rest of the country, but it's Ottoman Empire, and it's not snow, it's plague this time. And the imposition of quarantina is a horrible job, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it is, uh, 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 it is a novel about, medical novel about imposition of quarantina. Uh, in 1904, where that it is very political thing that uh, imposing people do this, do that, close your shop, don't go this, or, and they don't want to do it. And in the end, you see how political it gets. Well, we'll be curious to see, and maybe yes. Colombi and Dada will have some more work coming up uh, in the years coming. Uh, again, um, thank you all for coming to uh, New York. <laughs> It's amazing what they did.